I want to um, flip uh, sort of the, the flip side of that question, I guess, where the, the story I told at the beginning, you have an actual elected member who's willing to cross a picket line, in her view, for, for a broader picture. But then the flip side, which I think is the more positive side of, of women labor move, uh, leaders. Last month, I was listening to uh, John Tory on uh, Radio 1010, and uh, I was really surprised and kind of disappointed to hear Mark Ferguson, who represents the outside workers here in the city, on with John Tory, running down firefighters. Clearly, I think, in an attempt to save his members who are paramedics and, and saying a lot of, you know, what I thought were sort of nasty things. Now, people who know me know I have some skin in that game as well, so uh, so I'll admit that. My partner is a, is a firefighter, so I do have some skin in the game, but it, it seemed to me to be an attempt by Mark to protect his members and direct Ford's hatchet to firefighters and police officers when the city goes looking for savings in the emergency uh, services sector. And maybe I'm wrong, but I just, I can't picture and I can't remember a, a woman labor leader uh, playing into that kind of divide and conquer strategy quite so easily. I, I can't picture Leah Castleman, for example, when she was leading OPSU, going after other uh, other unions uh, to, uh, to try to protect OPSU members. And I wonder, so we were discussing a bit of a drawback that that women maybe aren't as militant on the picket line but is there is there a lesson there a lesson that maybe male leaders aren't getting as easily which is together we eat divided we starve uh nancy here i think that the one thing that women have uh in common is the recognition that without each other uh, we're not moving forward and when i say that it's not without each other in the labor movement it's without each other uh, in the community in the labor movement, where in the in government, wherever you are, I think that there's a general sense that women know that being inclusive, uh, women know that being equitable, women know that in order to get ahead, we actually all need to have a piece of the pie. That if you've got a larger slice than I do, uh, then that means that I don't have something that you have and instead of this notion of this race to the bottom because that sort of plays into this as well well you guys have you guys in the labor movement <laughs> have it all and that actually is a is wrong um, and for women in the labor movement their desire is to get more for women everywhere so I think we've recognized that I think there's some still some difficulty moving forward because I still think there's this notion that we can't be seen to be doing that or we can't be seen to be political if we're political if we're loud if we're out there if we're sticking it to you well we're we're the unkind word right uh, and so uh, you're either the B word or you're 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 you're, you're hanging back but I, I don't think there's an either or and I, the, the recognition of that, I think, amongst women today is growing, and, and uh, particularly in, in, in youth. Um, they're far more outspoken and far more involved in today's world than I think they ever have been before. And that's because it's going to have a massive impact on them, I'm, th I'm thinking. I think there's a danger in saying that, you know, women are more collective or are more likely to not uh, create divisions. I mean, if that was true, I mean, well, I think Britain would have looked much different under Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> no doubt. I think what's important here, and, with, and I, I just heard about that from you, Joel, about Mark Ferguson, and, uh, and that is disappointing because we do need unity more than ever now. And we also know that uh, when we're not united, that is when we suffer huge and huge defeats. Uh, I know that uh, during the days of the uh, the days of action in Ontario against Mike Harris, you know there was big divisions between what the rank and file membership wanted and what the leadership was providing, and ultimately there was a lot of sellouts, uh, and that and that made the movement crumble, and that was a really unfortunate defeat that I hope that we can learn from. And I feel like, in some ways, that might be a dress rehearsal for the huge movements to come with all the austerity that, that's heading us. Um, but what I think is important is that there's going to be a lot of debates in the unions of which way forward. And we have to, and I know this sounds, I don't want to simplify this, but unity is so important. You can't just fight for your own members and that's it. You have to look at the movement as a whole. And when I talked about organizing campaigns and, and mass demos and, and rallies and whatnot, 
it can't just be for unionized members. It, hell, that would be way too small. We're only 30% <laughs> of unionized members in Canada. Uh, and the, there's more of a bulk in Quebec than the rest of Canada. Uh, but what we have to do is we also have to outreach to all layers, to women, to youth, to students, to immigrants, to artists, to writers, uh, and really uh, to the unemployed, and really bring them in, really have a good banner to bring everybody underneath. And we also, I think the beauty of unions is they're democratic organizations. If there's a leadership and you're seeing uh, actions or decisions being made that you don't agree with, well, I believe that un you know, union members have the right to challenge that. And if you don't agree with your leaders, well, you can challenge them. And if they're still not uh, portraying your interests, well, then you can change them. And so I think that's really important to know there is debates within the unions, but there's mechanisms for people who want to keep that unity, want to fight for it, uh, can do have those opportunities to change it. And these are debates that are going to be ongoing, and we have to have them uh, in order for us to find that way forward. Hi there, Colleen. I totally agree. Um, when the Toronto Dist when the Toronto Board of Education and Scarborough, and when we all amalgamated back in uh, 1998, uh, we had so many different locals, so many different unions that all came together, and the same thing was going on. We had how many, how many, you know, we had CUPE, we had OPS, OPS, I believe, we had OSSTF, who were the, the, the Toronto education workers, the support workers, where were they going to go? And we all voted for CUPE, and that's how Local 4400 uh, was resurrected. When we talk about... Um, you know, different fights that are going on now. When we look at uh, the council, they want to cut. They want to cut all these programs. They want to, uh, you know, maybe put the paramedics with the firefighters and, you know, what we were talking about. I mean, again, the debates have to happen. There has to be focus groups. There has to be understanding. But when we talk about a union, again, we, I have over 430 job classifications in my unit. And when we talk about pay equity and we talk about men being involved, that's where we have to come together as, as a group and move forward. And, and, you know, we're not, everyone talks about us union folks, you know, we're greedy and it's all for our members. We're working for our members and we're working for people out there. We want to, you know, make your lives better. We want to make sure your children have proper jobs, decent wages, benefits and a, and a retirement, a pension that you could retire on and live with dignity. It, listen, um, if we're fighting with each other, we're actually just playing their game. Their game is to divide us, to divide the labor movement. But my experience has been that whatever's happened in the private sector has had a direct impact on the public sector. And I'll tell you what's about to happen in the public sector is going to have a massive impact on the private sector. And unless we start to recognize that and we are actually standing together, it doesn't matter whether it's your rally or my rally, your event or my event, we just all need to be there for each other. Colleen, your union was at the, uh, the forefront of a, a campaign a few years ago against school closings, and I thought it had a brilliant, brilliant tagline. It was not my school, not yours either. And I think that's the message because we all know what the right wing wants to do. They want to set us at each other's throats uh, and they do it uh, brilliantly. It's been done with, with school closings you know, across the province where you, you get parents worried about their local school to the point that they're willing to fight against someone else's neighborhood school because they're so scared. And, and I think all three of you hit the nail on the head when you said the labor movement has to rise above that and be a vision of something different where we're all for each other. And that leads me directly to my next question. Every year, we, we mention this, every year there are fewer and fewer people living in unionized households across this province. We, we're losing union members all the time. How do we reverse that trend? How do we begin to organize more workplaces? Just really briefly, you know, a couple of what are the key things that each of you think the labor movement needs to be doing so that we're adding union members year after year as opposed to having fewer and fewer people in uh, organized workplaces? Jenny, why don't you go first? I think there needs to be more organizing drives in a lot more workplaces. Um, also, we know, you know, I work for a, a small agency, you know, and I've been told that it's very difficult. You know, a lot of smaller agencies have been excluded or they've been told by unions, oh, it's too expensive to get your first, you know, collective agreement going. So I think that we, 
we have to look at the broader picture of organizing uh, society as a whole, right, in terms of like looking at all the different kind of workplaces, but not just picking and choosing which ones are more easy to do. Looking at where, where is the need? Where are people coming to you and saying, we want to get organized, we want to do this? We need to start seizing those opportunities as well as creating them. I think that uh, it's never, we desperately need to organize, as you said. We've lost over like 350,000 jobs in the manufacturing sector, if not way more. So it's very important that we start to organize on that front. Um, and, and also I think another, another bridge that we could be built, which I think actually QP Ontario and the Ontario Federation of Labor have started to do, is also building links with like uh, the student unions and building links with other movements, community organizations. I mean, funny enough, Mark Ferguson actually spoke really well at one of our housing events that the Toronto Young Democrats put on in partnership with the Esplanade community group down on the Esplanade community. So, um, so I think it's really important to be building those links as well as doing the organizing drives. I, I agree that there needs to be more organizing drives. And someone said to me, well, organizing is really hard these days. And I thought, well, uh, you know, when people first started organizing years ago, they were shooting people in the street. So uh, at least we're not organizing in those circumstances today. I also, I think we need to take opportunities. I, I hate to miss an opportunity. And I think the labor movement sometimes focuses on uh, a different a, a different way of organizing or a different agenda. And I think the opportunities to go to community groups to, again, this notion of networking and talking about why the labor movement is actually important. And that that requires work. I mean, that requires talking about historical elements of the labor movement and, and, and why we're here today and how we got here and how people got pensions and how people got benefits and, and why the private sector has good competitive wages. Well, it's because there's, there's unions. Uh, it isn't because the boss decided that, you know, that was a good chance for me to give you a good wage because that's just not true. They need to be competitive. Unions and the labor movement made them competitive. And so I think that we have to seize on opportunities.